We had a great meeting with um, New Bethany Family Worship Center when we were there. The pastor preached himself good. <coughs> Praise the Lord. You'd be glad to know that, amen? It was very good, very interesting. So praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, we are back on to talking about uh, the enemy and um, Christ descent into hell. And uh, just briefly, we'll want to um, recap what we talked about the last time, which has been a few, a couple of weeks ago. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray that we would be able to um, receive it. And Lord, we pray that we would not be confused. And Lord, that we'd be able to hold it lightly. And we thank you for it, Lord. You wrote everything in your word. You wrote everything in your word. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, we talked, uh, we ended up last time discussing that there were three um, levels of Sheol or Hades, the abode of the dead. The first two of these were mentioned in Jesus' parable, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, as recorded in Luke 16. And then the third was found in 2 Peter 2, 4. So first in, uh, with Lazarus, we have Abraham's bosom where Lazarus and Old Testament saints went at death. Then Gehenna, where the rich man and the ungodly went at death. And then Tartarus, or the lowest hell, where those went who perished in the great flood. So we, we're, we've kind of established um, that. Uh, it's interesting, there's a lot of things said about it, but they're not all said in the same place. And so as we, as we study it, we go from place to place, and, and hopefully it will come together for us as we look at what the scripture says. Now, Abraham's bosom was the intermediate place of comfort and rest for the godly dead while they were waiting God's deliverance. Below it and separated by a wide gulf, that's in uh, Luke 16, that uh, there was Gehenna which was an intermediate place of torment for the ungodly dead awaiting God's final judgment. Now this was all during the Old Testament period. Lower still than that was Tataras, where the disobedient during, the, during Noah's day were taken when they died under the judgment waters of the flood. And they also await the uh, great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, 11 through 15. So it's a, apparently, because of the way it speaks about these places, all three of these compartments of Sheol were under the earth. As the Old Testament saints spoke of going down into the grave, and the dead prophet Samuel came up when he appeared to Saul. Came up. So we would assume that they were somewhere in a spiritual place or a place of, of holding. Um, this does not mean that there is a purgatory. So don't let this think, you think that this is endorsing a purgatory. It's not. This is an Old Testament uh, thing that was spoken of both by Jesus and by the saints of old. Now, we talked about, uh, we'll talk about these. Let's start with the Tataras. The, the lower part. In, um, let's see, in 1 Peter 3, 19b, 1 Peter 3, 19. The scripture says that Jesus' spirit descended at death into the lower part the region of the lost, all the way to Tataras, the lowest hell, where he preached unto the spirits in prison. 1 Peter 3, 19, by which, well, let's read 18. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, 
being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he went also and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So here, the drowned multitudes <coughs> of the great flood were confined in Tartarus, in this lower part. They were imprisoned in this place of sorrow and torment, and uh, they were bound with the, the chains of their sins, and under um, greater or lesser degree of guilt and condemnation. Now, Jesus never condemned them or accused them to the Father or condemned them to the torments of hell, but he demonstrated the hope of life in the Spirit. Now, many of these people had heard Noah's righteous preaching while he was building the ark, and he talked and, and preached to them about the judgment and warned them of the judgment to come. And yet, his message could not save them. Some of them may have cried out for mercy before the mighty waters overcame them, but Noah and his family uh, were the only ones that had the grace or found the grace of God to physically survive the flood. Hebrews 11.7 says to us, by his behavior, by his faithfulness, it says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Okay, let's read it in the Amplified. Prompted by faith, Noah, being forewarned by God concerning events of which as yet there were no visible signs, took heed and diligently and reverently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his own family. By this, his faith, which relied on God, he passed judgment and sentence on the world's unbelief and became an heir and possessor of righteousness, that relation of being right into which God puts a person who has faith. Now, as you read this, at least as I read this, I see why Christians, believers, have trouble in a world that's decaying morally. Because our very adherence to our faith and our very lives, if we live godly lives, just judges them and condemns them. And so you have had people say to you, well, you don't have to condemn me. And you're not saying anything to them. You, you've all experienced that. You, well, you don't have to. Can you, who are you to condemn me? I said nothing. Well, you said nothing, but you are something. You are in Christ. And you are holy. And you are righteous through God. And so you can see that what applied here with Noah is also applying with us in this era. We will find that no matter what we're doing, we will offend some without even opening our mouths. Now, we know that Noah, he preached it loud and clear and demonstrated by making this ship in the coming of a flood of which they had never seen before because they'd never even seen rain at this time because the earth was being watered, they say, by uh, a mist that was all over the earth. And so when the foundations of the heavens and the earth were broken up and it began to rain, then it was uh, uh, something they had never seen. And it said Noah prepared the ark when he couldn't even see the signs of the problem. But he did what God told him to do. And so it's, it, it kind of, I don't know, kind of might help you with where you're at today, the way things are in, um, in our society. Because we find that uh, it's the faithfulness, our faithfulness to God, that condemns the world, just like Noah's faithfulness to God condemns the world. Now, let's look at... Um, Deuteronomy 32.22 for some other scriptures on this place. Deuteronomy 32.22. For a fire is kindled by mine anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth with its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. 
Then Psalm 86, um, 13. Eighty-six, thirteen. For great is your mercy and loving kindness toward me, for you have delivered me from the depths of Sheol, from the exceeding depths of affliction. And so, uh, let's see, thirteen. The King James says, "For great is your mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell," signifying there were other levels of hell. So lowest hell. Proverbs uh, 9.18. King James, he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. So that would be the, the, the deepest part of hell. Acts 2.31, moving into the New Testament. Acts 2.31. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Now, on this one, the Amplified says, he foreseeing this spoke by foreknowledge of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah. This is referring to David and what he said. And it says, uh, the resurrection of Christ, the Messiah, that he was not deserted in death, and left in Hades the state of departed spirits, nor did his body know decay or see destruction. Another cross-reference would be Psalm um, 1610. And then Ephesians 4, 9. Ephesians 4, 9. Well, we'll read this more times than one. Now, uh, 4, 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So um, the king, the Amplified says that he ascended. Now how can this, he ascended, mean but that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths or the lower parts of the earth? Verse 10 says, He who descended is the very same as he who also has ascended high above all heavens, that he, his presence, might fill all things, the whole universe, from the lowest to the highest. I think many times when we're reading these, we read them, but we really don't connect them sometimes to the subject matter at hand. I know that, that happens to me a lot. I just read them and, and I assume sometimes they mean something to me, other times they connect. That's why we read the Bible a lot, because we, we want it to connect somehow. I'll never forget the first time I read the Bible through in one year. It was like everything connected from the shotgun type of Bible reading that we were doing in the um, early 70s and the early 80s. Just uh, People would just go through and open their Bible and just read, and then they felt they had read. But it, you never had a connection, or you just read your favorite scriptures, or you read the scriptures for the problem you had. But reading it clear through was, I won't say it was a new concept because I'm sure it wasn't, but it was new to me because I was just born again in 1973. So uh, reading it through was a real challenge and, and I did it with the Navigator's um, reading program through the first time and it really connected it for me as far as the beginning to the end. And so that was, that's interesting. So I encourage you to, to keep reading, keep reading because it's important to do that. And so uh, we, we've got these, these pictures um, that we're going to try and pull together as, as we go through this, um, what we're talking about. Now the next level would be Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. The rest of the ungodly dead were confined to Gehenna, the middle level of Sheol. 
where they suffered the torments of unmet desires and the accusations of their consciences. In Reflections of Life After Death, Dr. Raymond Moody relates the near-death experiences of some of his patients. And uh, some of them had visions from the abode of the dead. Now, I think now we've had books where people say they went to hell and they saw the, the infernal regions and the, that type of thing. We've had books published. And so um, they, he would, they would say at death, they watched passing before them three-dimensional images of their life, every event in their lives. Not only the major events, but everything they ever said or did, uh, not uh, whether it was good or whether it was bad. And of course, if you read the accounts of other people who said they have had this near-death experience and experiences, most of them will say the same type of thing. And the Bible does say that we'll be held responsible for every word that we've ever spoken. And so uh, sometimes people who have bad accidents, I don't know if you've had a bad accident, I hope you haven't, but sometimes it's like time is suspended in the midst of that thing. You just, I don't know if your brain checks out. <laughs> I have no idea how it happened. I've, we've experienced in some accidents that we've had. And, and so everything kind of just goes really slow and some people have said their whole lives flashed before their eyes. Uh, and then whatever happened, happened. So I, I, it's hard to explain it, uh, but th these things do happen and people have reported them. So that's the only place you, can, you go from. And uh, you also see the effects that your behavior has had on other people that you didn't know before. And you all would have to realize, uh, be, being a highly intelligent Christian, that our behavior always affects someone else. Uh, so uh, there is always that repercussion to things that, that we do. And then um, the question would be, what have you done with your life? So it's kind of like being overexposed, I would think, <laughs> looking back on everything. But... Uh, one uh, patient that uh, out of his book, there's a quote, I looked down at the bewildered people, bent, dull, sadly depressed. They seemed to shuffle as someone on a chain gang, seemingly getting nowhere and not knowing where to go or who to follow. With crushed, hopeless faces, they seemed bound to some invisible, oppressive force, some person, object, or habit that they could not get away from. They were utterly perplexed. And so... If we, if we look at all the, the, the passages of, about death and in, in, in this, um, this hell, this compartment, multi-level compartment, uh, this, um, another quote from Dr. Moody said, drawing from other passages in the Bible, it's safe to assume that the gates of hell kept a tight lid on the cosmic grave and prior to Jesus' resurrection, the padlock of death kept those gates secure. The whole picture is an epitome of despair. Scores of people eternally buried, rotting in their own sins and trespasses, and programmed to follow the course of an evil master. So, uh, it's not pleasant. Not pleasant at all. Another fundamental difference between this level of Gehenna and the upper level, Abraham's bosom, is demonstrated by uh, the fact in Luke 16 that Jesus says there was a great gulf fixed between the two so that no one could cross from one side to the other. That's your New Testament where Jesus said that. So in death, then, there was a separation between believers and unbelievers in this place. And in hell, it appears that Jesus' spirit was unbound as he moved freely across back and forth through all of these places uh, and crossed into Tartarus, uh, crossed into Gehenna and to Abraham's bosom, and no one had ever done that before that's, that we have recorded. Now, the um, 
Saints that lived and died prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus could not immediately enter heaven because it was still closed to them due to sin. Only his atoning death opened, opened it. In the meantime, the departed saints went to Abraham's bosom to await the opening of heaven and the quickening of their spirit. And I think they knew what they were waiting for because I think uh, I see scripture where Moses and, and Abraham, they all saw Christ. They all saw things ahead in the realm of the spirit that they were not privy to. And so there were uh, hopes, there were fears, there were expectations of the righteous dead that those uh, things were, were going to be changed. And so, you know, until Jesus died, there was no man who could ascend to heaven because the accuser of the brethren, the devil, still had a place there. And in John 3, 12 through 13, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? For no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So before the advent and death of, of Jesus, the Messiah, those who died did not ascend into heaven. Men like Enoch and Elijah were taken into this place called Abraham's bosom. Christ had to first die and the veil be torn. Remember we talked about the veil being torn in two where then the cherubim were removed figuratively from the guarding of the tree of life and uh, opening the gates of heaven, the windows of heaven, whatever you want to call it. And uh, he died, he opened this heaven and then he descended to lead the dead out of hell. So it can be a little confusing to think about these things. Uh, if Enoch, Elijah, or anyone else could get into heaven before the death of Jesus, then all the Old Testament saints should have been admitted there at their death. Unless death wasn't the criteria. Uh, physical mortality is an issue of deeper sin. It's not an issue of whether you died here or you were translated or what happened. Uh, in Romans 5, 12 through 21, we see this, this great statement, in Adam all died. And by one man's offense, death reigned over all men. Even the righteous men, death still reigned. And since Enoch and Elijah were part of humanity, they had sin on their record, didn't they? They were born, they were born, and they were born in sin, like the rest of us. And so Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all. So they went into Abraham's bosom. In 2 Kings, Elijah was taken by the chariot of Israel into the sky by a whirlwind en route to Abraham's bosom. Uh, if we look at um, 2 Kings 1, 10 through 12, um, 7 through 2, 19. Don't bring these up. I'm just going to give the, the uh, scriptures. 17, 16, 21, 3 through 5. The, the, the picture is heaven as a sky, not heaven as a place where the throne of God dwells. And then in 2 Kings 13, 14, we have the same wording for Elisha's translation uh, at death. Uh, so they all were held there until such time as heaven was opened and Jesus then descended to the lower parts of the earth. All right, so when we 
didn't say that. What would happen with Moses and Elijah when they met with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? By divine intervention, they were released from Abraham's bosom to meet with him, uh, discuss with him about his death, what it would mean, what it would accomplish. So let's look at, at Luke 9, 30 through 31. 30, 30 through 31, Luke 9, 30 through 31. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in splendor and majesty and brightness and were speaking of his exit from life which he was about to bring to the realization at Jerusalem. And so this otherworldly type of thing happened, didn't it? I mean, it's uh, uh, totally um, different. But when God starts something, he gives pictures of it in the Bible, so he'll start like a new era or a new way of dealing with mankind. And so we see here that Moses and Elijah were there with him uh, at, at that point. And uh, this, they were there to encourage him to talk about what it was going to accomplish, to help him, I think, to get the vision before his eyes, what the end result of was going to happen. Luke 9, um, 53 shows us, Luke 9, verse 53, was that Jesus' face was set to go to Jerusalem. He had a purpose to go. He had a, an anticipation of what was going to happen. He knew because he was God. He was very man and very God. So he knew that the, there was going to be a release of all the righteous dead that were awaiting his coming, that the time was coming that he was going to arrive. He knew that. So in the midst of it, what is it Hebrews says? I don't have that scripture, but it says, for um, the joy of obtaining the prize, he endured. Hebrews 12.2. 12 12 12 12 Let's look at that. Thank you. Hebrews 12.2, Mike. Concordance is in the back. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, now... In, verse, in the Amplified, it says, Looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize was, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Psalm 110.1 1. is a reference to this. So we can see that uh, he had a picture of what was going to happen. He knew what the result of his death, his burial, his resurrection, he knew what it was going to bring. And it gave him joy to look at it. So it was not unusual that we would see that Moses and Elijah would come and strengthen him, encourage him, remind him, hey, we're waiting for you, right? <laughs> We're still waiting for you. Praise the Lord. And discuss with him uh, what was happening. Because here he fulfilled the um, Old Testament prophecy and the expectation, the hope of God's people. Um, where it was said, For thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. We read Psalm 86, 13, but let's read um, Psalm 16, 10. Psalm 16, 10. It is... Um, Amazing, if you think about David writing most of these psalms, 
and the picture that he must have had of Christ and what Christ was going to go through. And he says, um, let's look at 9. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My body too shall rest and confidently dwell in safety, for you will not abandon me to Sheol, the place of the dead. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Uh, King James says, you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Now David, by the Holy Spirit, wrote these things. Did he write them of himself? Um, he may have had a very personal relationship with what he saw in the realm of the Spirit, what he knew to be true. Uh, it, it's interesting what these men understood and knew by the realm of the Spirit in those days. Because even Moses, he said he would rather suffer for Christ than he would stay and be a son of the Pharaoh. He would rather give it all up for Christ. Moses said that in those days. So let's not forget that God had revealed himself to these people in such a way that it was life-changing. And what is, Hebrews says a wonderful thing. It says that Moses was always looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Abraham was looking for a city. They were all looking for the same thing. They were all waiting for the same thing. It's marvelous, isn't it? I mean, they had such a, a deep vision, it, it was uh, consumed their soulish nature. That it that transcended what they thought in the natural. And so Jesus himself was able to come out of death and hell because he had never committed any sin. He was made to be sin, but he had never committed sin. There was no sin in Christ. So the pains of death could not hold him. Acts 2.24. Look at Acts 2.24. But God raised him up, liberating him from the pangs of death, seeing that it was not possible for him to continue to be controlled or retained by it. Oh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Now think about that. It was not possible for him to continue to be controlled or retained by it. What did, what did Jesus say? He said, Satan comes, but he has no part in me. He can't find any, he, there's nothing for him in me. He was pure. He was holy. He was divine, actually. And so the devil had no claim on him. He couldn't hold him. If he went down there, he couldn't keep him there. He couldn't keep him in the grave. He could not keep him anywhere. He couldn't even kill him. He couldn't kill him. Jesus had to give up his life. He had to give up his own life on the cross because it didn't matter what they did to him. They could not kill him because he was life itself. Pretty awesome. Totally awesome. And so, death had and hell had no dominion over him. Let's look at Romans 6, 9. Because we know that Christ, the anointed one, being once raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. So, verse 8 says, to us. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Yeah. Is that cool? We shall live with him. Death has no power over him. He, because he had no sin. Amen. His body saw no corruption because the enemy had no authority over sinless flesh. No authority over sinless flesh. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Let's look at that one. First Timothy 
And without controversy, great is the mystery <coughs> excuse me, of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Made visible in the the flesh. And then in Acts 2.27 Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And you can see here that that's why his flesh would rest in hope. That is why death could not hold him. It's just important for us to recognize he may have become sin, but he took the punishment for sin. From there, he was victorious. They could not hold him. He was not down in hell, I don't believe, being tormented by demons. All right. Then, when he began to ascend from where he had descended, the scripture says in Ephesians 4, 8. Let's go over to Ephesians 4, 8, because we'll look at that here. Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, King James, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Therefore, in the Amplified, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, he led a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts on men. This uh, translation, this uh, phrase, cap led captivity captive, that originated really in the days of Deborah and Barak, as a song of victory over the oppressive enemy that they had in Judges 5, 12 through 13, and verse 26. If you remember the story, Sisera was, in, was Israel's deadly enemy. And he was a type of the devil in that picture there. And he had long confined God's people. They were actually hiding in caves, fearful, living in holes in the ground. Until we know that he was what? Wounded in his head. Remember the woman gave him milk and he went to sleep and she put the tent stake through his temple. And that was the end of him. She killed him. And so uh, in Barak's day after he was dead, the people went, the people of the Lord, the people of Israel went throughout the land the scripture tells us, rejoicing at their release from captivity. It was a wonderful thing. Can you imagine if you were living in caves, so fearful, if the, if the enemy dies, how happy you're going to be, how released you're going to be? Wow. And this foreshadows Christ's triumph over the grave and the saints released from death's bondage. So we could say that, and I just recognize that in this uh, this, this story is that when Jesus was crucified, there was a great earthquake and the graves were open, many of them, because they were just caves. And what then happened was at his resurrection, the dead people got up and ran around joyously, running in and out, seeing all, everybody in the city. So it kind of corresponds to what the people of Israel did in the time of Sisera, when he was killed, they all got out of their caves and they all ran around and were so excited because of what happened. So it, it kind of is a picture of, the, of what happened at the resurrection. Now the Bible reveals the threefold purpose of Christ's descent. Number one, he demonstrated life in the spirit because he passed freely through this. 
It couldn't hold him. There was no trap for him. He could go from one compartment to the other, which would have been uh, something to see. He was there to free captives, and he was there to fill all things from the lowest hell to the highest heaven. He that descended is the same also who ascended, again, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, far above all heavens, all of the atmospheric heavens, and then he, that he might fill all things. And so we could say with the, with the psalmist, um, Psalm 68, 18 through 20, that there is no place, no void he cannot fill. There's no deep, desolate, empty place that he cannot reach. There is no place in the universe that God, who made the universe, cannot touch and retrieve his children from. So it should encourage us, should totally encourage us and help us to have an understanding that he is greater than the enemy, he is greater than death, hell, and the grave, he is pure life, and Jesus was the same. And so there was a tremendous thing. So if we filled our heads with, with evil stories and, and have, have looked at things, um, terror things and, and things that talk about the walking dead and the zombies and all of that, we should rebuke that in our lives and because it brings fear to us. And then we should recognize that there is no place we would be out of the reach of God. No place. No place. We have no fear in death because he fills it all. He is conqueror, more than a conqueror. And in 1 Peter 3.22, it says, By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. After he descended, he was exalted to God's right hand in the heavens with everything, like every tongue shall confess, right? Every knee shall bow to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everything made subject unto him. And so his descent symbolizes or illustrates his power to bring us to God. There is no place that we would ever, that he would never, ever, uh, could not go. He can go and is gone everywhere. Now, many, can, many have twisted this doctrine. There's been a lot of false doctrine, and we're not going to go through that because that's not going to, to help us any. But Hebrews 2.14 tells us, and I just love this scripture. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, they also, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through, of, through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Okay, let's, let's read it in the Amplified. Since therefore these his children share in flesh and blood in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in similar manner partook of the same nature that by going through death he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Make of not him who had the power over death. And 15 says also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. And so when we talk about those being held in Gehenna, I want you to know, and you probably do know, that you don't have to be in hell to suffer like that. You can suffer like that every day of your life on this earth if you choose or you don't know Christ and you are afraid of death. It is a haunting fear. It takes carefulness outside the bounds of God's will and turns it into a legalistic, ritualistic, fearful, compulsive obsession for people, this fear of death. Uh, for example, panic attacks. Panic attacks come from what? 
I think they come from the spirit of fear, fear of death, panic attacks, interesting. So, Christ brought God's rule into the place of death. Since Satan had the power of death, we're not saying that Satan lived there, but he had the power, he had the power of death. So when Jesus went down, he revealed his supreme sovereignty as Lord of all things on the earth. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Let's quickly look at Philippians 2, 10 and 11. He was Lord of everything. And that at, in the name of Jesus, every knee should and must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Romans 4, 8, 8 uh, and 9 tells us that it was for this reason. Romans 14, 8 and 9. Whether we live or whether we, uh, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. You remember that scripture where it said, he said that he was not dead, he was not the, he was not the God of the dead, he was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was not the God of the dead, means that they were still living in a different realm, in a different place, but they still were living. Glory to God in the highest. So his victory was much more than we have just, maybe maybe you knew it all, but I don't think any of us really know it all still. So we tie these scriptures together and we begin to see that there's more to it maybe than what we previously thought, and it's actually more comforting to know that, I mean, here he was, death could not hold him. Uh, death could not hold him, and he could not rot in the grave. And it's the same spirit that dwells in you and me that raised him from the dead. Yeah. woo We should be in good shape, amen? Whether we live or die, it makes no difference. Because we are in Christ, we are in him, and in him is life, and life eternal. So I hope that encourages you. I'm going to quit there, praise the Lord, glory to God. So um, I, uh, I got, it, just reading the scriptures kind of lifts you up, doesn't it? It kind of just, wow, quickens us, makes us more alive in our faith and, and our recognizing that uh, no matter what has happened in our lives, no matter who has died or who has whatever, God is greater than all of those things. He's greater than we do not have to worry about our eternal place. Not that we believe that we're always saved if we act sinfully. But we don't believe that. We don't teach that. But we do recognize that if we are in Christ and we are living in him and we love him, then he will never let us go. He said, nobody can take you out of my hand. Nobody. Because if he's sinless, we are also seen in him. And we are also, First John tells us about that also. Not to go into it tonight, but praise the Lord. Glory to God. Lord, we just thank you for your word. For your word is the final authority. And Lord, we know that even it was said that some of this is hard to understand. It's hard to understand. But we don't have to make up stories and fables to make it understandable. All we need to do is accept what you said about it. And what you said about it is the truth. And it governs our life. It governs the whole world. Whether it wants to be governed by it or not, it governs the whole world. For you fill all things in all with yourself. And so your pressures bear upon the just and the unjust. And your rain falls on the just and the unjust. And Lord, you will do what you have said you would do because you said when you send your word, it will never return to you void. So tonight, we in our hearts thank you so much and we just give you glory. And 
praise and thank you for caring for us so much in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Should we be dismissed? Glory to God. Oh, yeah, Ray and Jackie Brooks will be in this weekend, so I hope you'll be here, bring a friend. Uh, it'll be a great experience for you. Bring yourself, bring a friend, glory to God. Uh, and um, uh, let me tell you one thing before you leave. I just want to tell you one thing. This, this, these people, he's kind of a flat-footed preacher, and uh, that's fine. I mean, everybody has their own style, their own way. But we were on Decatur years ago. It was 1999, um, actually. I remember it myself, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> 1999. <laughs> and um, my father was very, very ill. He was 89, 89 years old. We wanted him to make it into the millennium. And it was March, and Ray and Jackie were with us. And it was just increasingly more difficult to keep him because I was his primary caregiver. And he was very, very ill. And then I had an affiliation with a ministry in um, another state that I was working with and helping them with their, their finances and their books. And so, I mean, it was just a lot on me at the time. And it, was, it wasn't an easy time for me. I mean, I, I understand. Uh, I was kind of like a sandwich. You know, I had all these things, and I was squashed in between them, kids and and family and all of this stuff, and they were squashed in there, like squashed. And he, he came and he ministered, and he said to me, he, he just looked at me, there was no big thing, and he said, he said, God is going to simplify your life within a, within a month. He says, it'd be shorter than a month. He's going to simplify your life. And for some, of, some of you were here when that was said. And I'm like, Simplify my life? Oh, how could you simplify my life? What I have to tell you is the next day, on Monday, the person from the Southern State called me and fired me off of her board and, and taking her books. She found somebody else she wanted to do it. I went, well, I was doing it for free. It didn't bother me in the least. You know, it's like, oh, she fired me. I didn't even feel rejected. I just rejoiced, you know. And within the next week, my father passed away. And there I was, spinning around with no, no problems. I mean, I had stress withdrawal. I was like, what am I supposed to do? I, mean, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't have anybody to take care of. What's going on? And, uh, but it was interesting. So don't discount, because the ministry is very powerful. And I will never forget that, because it was just like, bam, it was in a week, and it was all over with. I was like spinning around. God is remarkable. And he will speak to you, you know, so you know it's all is well. All is well. All is well, folks. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, we'll see you Sunday. Woohoo! Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today at Wellspring Church of All Nations, 4870 Janelle Drive, right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Pastor George Stover. I pray that you'll come and visit us uh, we're a Holy Ghost, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, not ashamed of it congregation right here in the northwest part of Las Vegas. So come on out and uh, let God minister to you. Uh, we'll really be glad if you do. And let's face it, you need us and we need you. We need you and you need us. And so we pray that you'll come and be a part of uh, this wonderful growing congregation. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.